Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we meet small business owners working hard to succeed amid their changing industries. In New York, we visit a family farm growing high quality cannabis to ensure the safety and correct dosing of their products sold in newly legal stores. And in Ohio, we visit an RV remodeling company where workers enjoy a four day work week. But first, we take you to Louisiana, where a high-demand southern delicacy is in short supply. One of the state's most famous exports, crawfish, is typically in season from January through June. But recent weather conditions have made them scarce. Janet Chamlian shows us the impact it's having on the local economy. Those look good. Yeah, they're awesome. Cracking and peeling is serious business in the South this time of year. <laughs> it's crawfish season. The crustacean that looks like a tiny lobster and tastes like a salty combination of shrimp and crab. Hey, crawfish! At the Cajun table in Lafayette, it's busier than usual. Pricier, too. Astronomically more expensive. Yeah. So serious, Cajun Table is one of the few restaurants in the heart of Creole country that has crawfish supply. What's the season like this year? It's very, very slow start. I've never seen the uh, drastic decrease in crawfish like I've seen this year. Sean Swear is the owner of Cajun Table and a lifelong crawfish farmer. Learning from his dad on these 350 acres of crawfish farmland. Harvesting his own fields is the only reason he has crawfish, but not nearly enough. When you're out on the boat, how many sacks are you bringing in now compared to normal this time of year? What we're bringing in now is about seven to eight sacks, and we're running 4,000 cages. So what we normally would be bringing in right now is at least 30 to 40 sacks. Swear says that's less than 20% of his normal haul. You can pick out the old bait, look. Okay. That, throw that in the water. He yeah. took us out on his boat to see what that looks like. Normally, these cages hold dozens of crawfish, but today, there are only a handful. He rebates the cage, hoping for better luck on the next pass. What's causing this? So we had an extreme drought and heat during the summer. Pretty much a record-breaking drought. One of the driest seasons on record last year means the rice fields used to harvest crawfish didn't get enough rain. Weeks of triple-digit heat sent the crustaceans burrowing deeper into the mud, many unable to emerge. What did the crawfish sell roughly for last summer? Last year at this time, we were selling crawfish for $2.75 a pound. And now? We're selling for $10 a pound. This is the uh, peeling room. Scott Broussard is one of the nation's largest crawfish wholesalers, shipping in a normal year millions of mud bugs. How many people would normally be working in here right now? In this room by itself, about 150 with the support people. His massive plant is at a virtual standstill. Delivery trucks are idle. And this refrigerated room, usually packed with thousands of sacks of crawfish, is down to a few dozen. It's going to hurt our local economy unconditionally. This industry produces over $300 million a year for our local farmers and, and economy here. We're going to be less than 10% of that. There's always a waiting line. Anthony Arsenault has owned Hawks Crawfish for more than four decades. With no crawfish, nobody here, empty parking lot. In years past, the lines to get in were legendary. Hawks is open only in crawfish season, roughly January through June. When will you open this year? Probably not till the end of March, or hopefully, possibly April. What is that doing to your business? Destroying it. On a busy night, some 400 people pack the place, chowing down on 2,000 pounds. If I got every crawfish in the state right now, it wouldn't be enough. Experts say hotter summers will likely continue. Researchers at Louisiana State University are studying the impact of climate change on crawfish production. When do you think you'll really see the kind of supply that you need? I may not see the kind of supply we need until 
May, June until the season's over. Okay, crawfish, here we go. Swear says this year, crawfishing feels more like a hobby than a business. Its <laughs> costs exceed the catch. It's a lifestyle he loves and loves to share. You're a good crawfish woman. But love, as they say, doesn't pay the bills. Swear hopes the end of the season will. Hopefully this last few months will account for what we've missed out on the first few. Can that really happen? I've, I'm just remaining hopeful. The rice paddies were a southern staple as harvested. This year, not a field of dreams. Woo! Good one! Now to another crustacean business in survival mode. For the second year in a row, Alaska canceled their famous snow crab season due to the declining crab population. Jonathan Vigliotti learns about the effort to save the species and the small businesses that depend on them. Alaska's Kodiak Archipelago is known for its catch of the day. While Gabriel Prout is grateful for his modest haul of king crab, it's the vanishing of another variety that has this fishing port bracing for financial fallout. We're still definitely in survival mode trying to find a way to, to stay in business. Last season, when we first met Prout, confusion. Where have the snow crab gone? Now, a sense of panic in the state's fisheries, which produce 60% of the nation's seafood. It's just still extremely difficult to, to fathom how we go from a healthy population in the Bering Sea to two closures in a row. While Proud is barely holding on, others like Joshua Songstad have lost everything. Um, all of a sudden now I'm at home with no income and really not much to do. The crisis first began in early 2022 after biologists discovered an estimated 10 billion crabs disappeared, a 90% plunge in the population. When you first saw the results in 2021, what went on in your mind? The first reaction was, this, is this real? You know, we looked at, it was almost a flat line. Ben Daly with Alaska Department of Fish and Game assisted in the search. Environmental conditions are changing rapidly. According to new research from NOAA, a marine heat wave linked to climate change likely impacted their food supply and drove them to starvation. Look for causes. Biologists hope this second round of suspensions will give the remaining snow crab population time to bulk back up. But with the climate threat only growing, there's concern the snow crabs, along with the industry that depends on them, will continue to shrink. I'm a fourth generation fisherman. If we keep going the way we're going, there's not gonna be any of us left. Coming up, more states are legalizing marijuana, but what measures are being taken to ensure its safety? This is Eye on America. Welcome back. Cannabis is now legal in 24 states and the District of Columbia, but it spurred unlicensed dispensaries to pop up alongside regulated shops. There could be a hidden risk in the products sold there. Dr. Celine Gounder visits one family-owned farm to see how they test for purity and potency in their products. On this farm in upstate New York, Melanie Dobson and her family closely watch their prize crop. Here you see the fan leaves, here are the sugar leaves, and this is the flower. The high value area are the resinous glands that produce the oils, CBD, THC, and the terpenes, which give the flower its scent. Under strict sanitary conditions, Dobson and her family grow cannabis, which was until two years ago illegal in New York State. What is it that you're tagging here? This allows us when we harvest to know exactly which set of plants are in the batch that we've harvested. Dobson and her sister Freya track the cannabis from the greenhouse and the fields to the drying room, to the rolling, and packaging room. Two years ago, the sisters were growing cannabis out west when their brother offered them a new opportunity back home. Ben called us and he said, why don't you come back east and, and work, work with me? Ben Dobson was in upstate New York, 
marrying organic farming with hemp production. I needed help building a company and a brand. I was calling since from April when we got the license, like when are you gonna come back? Cannabis farming is in the Dobson family's blood. Their father, Ted, grew hemp and cannabis while the siblings were growing up, before there were any legal growers. What makes the cannabis from licensed, regulated growers like Hudson Cannabis different from what you get from illegal growers in shops is all the measures taken to standardize potency and minimize contaminants. They're looking at different bacteria and um, fungi. They're also looking at other toxins, including pesticides and um, heavy metals. A 2022 study found that 40% of products sold by illegal cannabis shops in New York City contained toxic contaminants, including bacteria, fungus, heavy metals, pesticides, and cancer-causing toxins. Researchers also found that many of the products tested did not contain the amount of THC advertised on the label. How are you doing? Good, how are you? But legal growers like Hudson Cannabis are required to test samples at third-party labs. New York has the strictest requirements of any state. Once cannabis products clear testing, they're distributed to licensed dispensaries across the state. Arena Hankin Biggers is the president of a Manhattan dispensary called Union Square Travel Agency. The product that you sell is not just tested for contaminants, it's also tested for potency. Why does that matter? Because you don't want a bad experience, right? You're gonna really have a negative reaction in many cases, increased paranoia. Um, the effects of the high will last a lot longer. The potency of cannabis products can range widely and may not be accurately labeled at illegal shops, no matter how fancy the packaging. This means that consumers can't safely regulate the dose they're taking. How is a consumer supposed to know if a dispensary is a licensed legal one or not? They're a blue sticker with a square QR code, and you can scan it and ensure that space is a licensed space. Why do you specifically choose to go to a licensed dispensary rather than any place else? Uh, quality control. I'm one of the baby boomers who grew up partaking in, in cannabis when it was not legal. But now that I'm older, I want to go to a place that believes in science and where it's reliable. But legal cannabis often costs more because of licensing fees, taxes, and the cost of testing. One batch of cannabis for us uh, costs about $4,500 in testing. There's a really slim margin to capture. Uh, in a very competitive landscape. Right. And the illicit market doesn't have to pay those licensing fees or the taxes or for testing. Yeah. Mm -mm. And they don't pay the IRS. And right ultimately now. it hurts the customer who doesn't necessarily know better. From upstate New York to Southern California, another family owned shop is making an impact. The Donut Man is a beloved staple in the community, bringing little-known Japanese history to light one donut at a time. Adam Yamaguchi meets the owner living out his American dream. Off of Route 66 in Southern California, this small donut shop has been a community fixture for decades. Yeah. Jim Nakano is the Donut Man. He opened the shop with his wife in 1972. Why donuts? Uh, because my wife likes hot donuts. <laughs> and she's not the only one. From glazed to signature strawberry, there's no shortage of crowd pleasers. Come to Glendora, have a strawberry donut. They're terrific. This is our specialty. Oh, that is so good. As uniquely American as the donut, so too is Nakano's personal story. During World War II, at just two years old, he was sent with his mother to a Japanese-American internment camp. So many Americans do not know about this chapter in our history. And some of them don't believe it, you know, that our country would do that to people. You don't want that history to, to die. Learn about your culture, learn about your family, and all that, because uh, that will make us closer. A family that now extends to the entire community. This donor shop has given us so much opportunity to meet different people. I'm just thankful that we were given the opportunity and uh, we made the best of it, the American dream. Ahead, work less and achieve more. A shorter work week could be the new norm. That story is next.
We close our show with a movement that's gaining momentum in the workplace. The promise of a four-day work week is challenging the traditional Monday to Friday model. Brooke Silverbraga looks at the pros and cons and one company where it's already working. Advanced RV outside Cleveland, Ohio is no hotbed of ivory tower theories on the future of work. No, it's the kind of place where when the boss forwarded an email about testing a four-day week, the workers mostly rolled their eyes. I read it and kind of chuckled a little bit, like, oh, that's cool, yeah, that probably works great in Europe. I was a little skeptical at first. When I first heard that, I thought it was a joke. No way is this gonna work. Not a chance in Hades. Advanced RV's 50 employees were already plenty busy making high-end, highly customized camper vans. Dave MacArthur handles metal fabrication. Brent Figuera works on the electric. Chris Perko does quality control. Mike Griffiths oversees production. But it was owner Mike Neuendorfer who had read an article suggesting a radical change. Working four days a week, just eight hours a day, but still paying everyone their full salary while aiming to maintain their old five-day productivity. It would be a huge challenge, but if it worked, it would be the most significant thing I've ever done. Can you imagine giving 50 people a three-day weekend? That's uh, it's pretty amazing, every week. So that was the attraction. You realized the impact this would have on people's lives. I did, to some degree. <laughs> did people think there was a catch at first? What was the reaction? <laughs> yeah. But there wasn't a catch. In 2022, they joined 40 other North American companies in a six-month trial organized by Four Day Week Global. Now, the other companies in the trial were mostly places where everyone works on a laptop, small tech companies and nonprofits. So Advanced RV became a special kind of test case. Could a Rust Belt automotive company really implement a labor movement fantasy? At first it was, well, we're all gonna take this day off, we're all gonna take that day. And it's like, okay guys, wait a minute. It's not gonna work like that. The way it would work, they learned, was with a series of compromises and adjustments. You know, one guy will take Monday, the other guy takes Friday. We usually try to schedule any doctor's appointments or dentist appointments, like, on our day off. But now remember, for the trial to be a success, they still had to maintain their old five-day output. Do we have enough inefficiencies in our day that we can eliminate to still get the same amount of work done? It's saying there are eight hours a week that, you know what, you don't even need to be here. Mm-hmm. You know, the first big one was, what meetings are we having every week that really aren't very useful for us? You know, we changed meeting protocols, we changed processes, we changed communication protocols, and all of it is little things. The biggest thing... Everybody's focused. We heard over and over... It seems like we're getting more done than last time. ...is motivation to make the schedule permanent. If people really want it, they can make it work, I think. But people have to work to make it happen. Yes, it ain't just gonna ha you ain't just gonna get that extra day off and not have to do anything to yeah. accomplish that. Yeah, what is the trade? What do you have to give to get this? Here, it was just like everybody working together. Everybody working a little extra. I was really skeptical about it. I didn't think it was gonna happen, but I mean, it really, it's amazed me that it's happened. A survey after six months found 95% of workers in the 41 trial companies wanted to keep the new schedule. And none of those companies said they'd go back to five days, at least for now. So could this really be the future of the American Monday? Walking the dog, working in the garage. It's just great to have an extra day to be able to do that. I've heard about the movement for a four-day work week like for 10, 20 years now, but it's really gaining more um, momentum now. Stephen Greenhouse was the longtime labor reporter for the New York Times. Part of it is Americans seem more concerned about work-life balance than was the case 10 and 20, 30, 40 years ago. They don't want work controlling their lives, dictating their lives. They want to have control. Major changes to the way we work, Greenhouse says, almost always follow decades of popular protest for change. But if the goal is a 32-hour work week, there may be a lesson in how we settled on a 40-hour work week just 100 years ago. Really, the big most important development was Henry Ford changed his factories from nine hours a day to eight hours a day. So Ford makes this change, but that's just one company. Other places then felt pressure to follow? Well, Ford 
at the time was arguably the nation's most prominent company. And I think a lot of other companies, a lot of other industries felt we better do what Henry did because Henry Ford is making a gazillion dollars and is leading the way. The Ford Day movement is still waiting for its Henry Ford. Many of the most prominent companies of this era are famous for pushing employees to work more, not less. Even Mike Neuendorfer says this isn't for everyone. Uh, I'm not evangelical about it. The structures of businesses are so different. It worked here, he says, because only one shareholder had to agree, him. And the workers weren't just punching a clock, but banding together to be more efficient. If they don't hit their goals, the five-day schedule could come back. This is probably one but of best he doesn't expect that. Long, long Too many people now are hooked on the pleasures of their endless long weekends. And Neuendorfer thinks, eventually, they'll have much more company. Changes are accepted over time. The number of people who experience the, the joy and the freedom and the uh, creativity of having a three-day weekend is just huge. And it's going to be a driving force, I think. But I don't know how it's going to happen or how quickly it's going to happen. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream this right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.